Greetings, everyone. Nice of you to join us for this edition of Disaster Hack. In this video, we'll be looking at what is often ignored or overlooked in emergency management, the assessment of damages resulting from a disaster. Today, I will share information that will identify the importance of damage assessment, mention damage assessment challenges that you should anticipate, discuss the types and methods of damage assessment, and finally, I'll explore the process of damage assessment and lessons learned. To start off, let's define what damage assessment is. Damage assessment identifies the extent of destruction, including individual losses as well as overall impact on the community. In this sense, damage assessment is related to both response and recovery operations. An important point to keep in mind is that damage assessment is really an essential function after a disaster occurs. Damage assessment identifies immediate needs, influences what material will be sent to the affected area. It also determines if structures are habitable. For instance, tags may be used on or placed on homes, green for those that are habitable, yellow for those with dangerous conditions and not likely to be inhabitable at least until repairs are made, and then finally red tags are used for uninhabitable buildings. Also, without a damage assessment, you will not know how bad things are, what needs to be done, and what resources are needed. There are three different types of assessments to be aware of. First of all, there's a rapid assessment to assess the situation quickly. There's a preliminary damage assessment where you evaluate the need for federal help. And then finally, there's a technical assessment where engineers, for example, determine the costs and the exact repair needs. Next, it's imperative that we recognize how the rapid preliminary and technical assessments are conducted. First, personnel may drive to and around the disaster scene to get a sense of what has taken place. Second, if driving is not possible due to debris, floods, or the extent of damages, an aerial assessment may be utilized. Normally, this includes political leaders in a plane or helicopter, but today drones are an increasingly valuable tool for damage assessment. Finally, personnel from the Red Cross, the building department, and other engineers may walk around the disaster site and evaluate damages firsthand. Those involved in damage assessment should anticipate a few problems. Damage assessment reports may lack information, have duplicate information, or inaccurate information. It's also difficult to collaborate with all of those involved, first responders, Red Cross personnel, volunteers, engineers, and various emergency management personnel at the local, state, tribal, and federal levels may be involved. Also, it may be impossible to access a site initially due to debris or floodwaters, and damage assessment can be dangerous because buildings are in a weakened state. These challenges should be kept in mind and efforts should be taken to address them. A few measures can help you conduct a successful damage assessment. First, hold meetings to discuss the forms you will use and plan routes. Second, ensure you are using a consistent scale to measure damages and be sure to determine if buildings and homes are safe, sanitary, and secure. Finally, compile resorts carefully and share them with appropriate local, state, tribal, and federal emergency management officials. I was able to conduct a study of the damage assessment process after the December 2003 Paso Robles earthquake. Let me share a few of those lessons with you now. First, Damage assessment plays a vital role during the initial minutes and hours of disaster response operations. Second, damage assessment is crucial to the recovery phase of emergency management. Third, damage assessment is dangerous, but it does promote a safer environment for the public and others. Fourth, there is a convergence of personnel at the scene to conduct disaster assessments. Fifth, there are different types of damage assessments and diverse methods to accomplish them. Sixth, damage assessment is not a one-time occurrence, but occurs frequently. Seventh, 
accuracy of damage assessments may be questionable. 8. Damage assessment is a politically salient activity after disasters. In other words, politicians will become involved in that process. Ninth, there are several challenges confronting damage assessment personnel, and we've talked about those. And then finally, steps can be taken before and after disaster to ensure an efficient and effective damage assessment process. Ultimately, the damage assessment process in Paso Robles was successful. Those involved credited their planning, training, exercises, standard operating procedures, and collaboration with others. If you would like further details on this case, please search for the following article on Google. There's also a video that shares the findings of this particular study. I would encourage you to look at that as well. Thanks so much for tuning in and have a great day.